Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Lowy Institute for this memorial event for Martin Indyk, a long-term associate of the Institute, a distinguished Australian and an old friend of mine. I'm Michael Fullylove, and we at the Institute are pleased to host you in association with the Indic family at Bly Street this evening. Let me acknowledge, first of all, the Indic family, including Martin's siblings, Shelley and Ivor, board members of the Lowy Institute, Peter Khalil, representing the Prime Minister, Christine Elder, the US Consul General, Rabbi Ben Elton, um, many other friends of Martin and friends of the Institute here today. Um, ladies and gentlemen, there's a distinguished group of speakers um, here this evening, and um, there's not a few of them because Martin had not a few admirers and friends. So you're going to hear from a very interesting um, and impressive uh, group of individuals this evening. Before I pass to the first substantive speaker, Stephen Lowy, let me make a few comments of my own. I first met Martin Indyk 22 years ago. Um, it was in 2002 and I was hoping to set up a small Australian think tank and I was trying to raise the funds for it and I came into Frank Lowy's orbit and I gave Frank Lowy my pitch for this small Australian think tank and he listened carefully and then he gave me an unforgettable reply. I don't want to do that, Michael, he said, but I might like to do something bigger. As everyone in this room knows, Frank Lowy thinks big. And Frank told me that when he travelled around the world, he would comb through newspapers for mentions of Australia and invariably he'd only find references to shark attacks and tennis players. And Frank said he had nothing against shark attacks and tennis players, but he would like Australia to be known for the quality of its ideas and its thinkers. And he asked me to write a feasibility study for a new institute, and as part of that, to interview prominent think tankers from around the world. The first person he asked me to interview was Martin Indyk. Martin was a Sydney cider, a boy from Castle Crag, I believe, with roots in Bondi, who'd gone on to establish a think tank in Washington. He'd been talent, talent spotted by Bill Clinton to serve as his senior advisor on the Middle East. He had served twice as Clinton's ambassador to Israel. So I turned up at Washington, in Washington at the Brookings Institution. Uh, George W. Bush was president, so Martin was out of government and Martin was a senior fellow at Brookings. And from the start, Martin was a great enthusiast for this idea. He became a founding member of the Lowy Institute board on which he served for the rest of his life. Last October, we brought Martin back to Australia for what was, I believe, his final visit home, during which he gave a speech from this stage. I last saw Martin in, earlier this year at Henry Kissinger's memorial service at the Temple Emmanuel on Fifth Avenue, um, where Martin, who was in a wheelchair by then, was surrounded, literally surrounded by admirers from the Clintons down. Martin's life epitomised, in a way, the Lowy Institute's ambitions. Frank Lowy told us that the Lowy Institute should bring the world to Australia and take Australia to the world. And in his life, Martin did both these things. Few Australians have had a greater impact on the world, and for good, than Martin Indyk. Throughout his life, Martin's counsel was sought in the highest political circles. He was deeply committed to the security and prosperity of the State of Israel. He was also a peacemaker who believed profoundly in a two-state solution. He worked towards that under President Clinton and later under President Obama. Martin fell short of achieving this goal, as everyone has fallen short, but he never stopped working towards it. To quote Jewish teachings, it is not your duty to finish the work, but neither are you at liberty to neglect it. Many of you know that in his last months on earth, Martin published an important article in Foreign Affairs arguing that the two-state solution is not dead. And of course, we know that in the Holy Land, resurrections are not completely unheard of. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Martin was a fine American public servant but he retained his Australian sensibilities, his Australian sense of humour and his Australian accent. 
In fact, he told me that one of the reasons Bill Clinton liked having him around was that they both had funny accents. I had a two decade long association with Martin. I admired his intelligence and ambition. I appreciated his friendship and that of his lovely wife, Gail. May Martin's memory be a blessing. Ladies and gentlemen, now let me call on the Deputy Chairman of the Lowy Institute, Stephen Lowy, to make some remarks on behalf of Sir Frank Lowy and the Institute's board. Stephen. I didn't know you were a Jewish scholar, Michael. Very good. Shelley, Ivor, the Indic family, many friends with us today. I'm honoured here to be representing my dad. I was a very close friend of Martin and, and also the board of the Lowy Institute. What I'll do is read a personal note out from dad in the first instance, because obviously he can't be here. And then I'll say a few words on my own account. So from my father, but without a Hungarian accent. <laughs> Martin's achievements were unquestionably impressive. And while others will talk about them today, I want to talk about Martin, the man. I knew his mother and father, and I can tell you, he came from an enlightened home. Mary and John were Polish Jewish immigrants, and they shaped his values. I really got to know Martin about 20 plus years ago when I was preparing to move into the world of think tanks. This was unknown territory for me, and Martin helped me find my way. His advice on creating the Institute was invaluable and ranged from the intellectual to the architectural. I remember him telling me quite seriously how a historic building with wood panelling and a grand reception room would give us instant gravitas. It would make the Lowy Institute a venue of choice for important debates and for international visitors of note. So of course, would be its intellectual capital. Australia shaped Martin too. While brilliant, he could also be blunt, irreverent, and unafraid to speak his mind. Although he never tiptoed through a conversation, his passion for peace shone through and he remained decent. Not only was Martin a master public intellectual, he was generous with his knowledge and always reachable. When I wanted to develop the INSS, the Institute for National Security Studies in Israel, he was by my side. He became a kind of ambassador for us in Israel, in Washington, and at the Council for Foreign Relations in New York. Martin and I got to know each other very well around the board and dinner tables. We worked together. We went on holiday together. We clashed. We celebrated. We laughed and we argued. I can say quite frankly that I learned a lot from him about international relationships and diplomacy. Now I'm going to miss his clear thinking, his challenging conversation and his wise counsel and friendship. Well, welcome. How fitting that we're in this historic building with wood panelling. And not a, not a shabby reception room as well. I think it's very appropriate we're here tonight. And thank you for asking us to host this. We're very honoured at the Lowy Institute to be hosting Martin's Memorial. On a personal note, as an inaugural board member of the Lowy Institute, I've also known Martin for just over 20 years. I learned an enormous amount from Martin, not only about international diplomacy, politics, policy, et cetera, that, that Michael so eloquently spoke about, but also on a personal level. We did spend much time together. Martin's uh, experiences from Brookings, 
from the CFR, Council of Foreign Relations in New York, and also, of course, his immense um, diplomatic experience. It gave a lot to the Institute. It gave a lot to the, particularly around the board table. His experience, his wisdom, his wise counsel was invaluable, and I have no doubt that we will miss it uh, very, very much. A highlight uh, was listening to Martin around the board table. At each board meeting, we would sort of go around the world and have a sense of have, have um, experts speak on, on different areas of the world. And Martin always spoke, of course, about US policy, US politics, and of course, Israel and the Middle East. Uh, and in the last uh, 20 years or so, there's been much to talk about uh, on all topics. Uh, his, his analysis, his deep analysis, he, the way he articulated very, very complex issues with such passion and decency, they were a hallmark of our board meetings, and I have no doubt, and I see a number of board, me board members here with us today, they will no doubt miss it. We actually had a board meeting a few days after October 7. I think actually that was the last time I, I saw Martin. I was not able to be here when he came to Sydney. Um, and uh, of course, very big topic of the world was taking place and having Martin there uh, to describe his, his perspective of it um, uh, was, was very, very special. In fact, if I remember correctly, Michael, you and I were talking about this he described the consequences of October 7 as biblical. I hope that, uh, I hope that he'll be proved wrong in that. So on behalf of the board, all of the board, and friends of the Lowy Institute, there are many speakers tonight, but I want to respect time of others. And um, we are very proud and honoured to host you tonight. And as Michael said, we wish you the family long life and may Martin's memory be a blessing. Thank you, everybody. Good evening, everyone. Uh, there are many prominent, indeed eminent, Australians here tonight to remember and farewell another, I would say, preeminent Australian in Martin Indic, even though he was technically an American by citizenship in the second half of his life, he was very much and always will be uh, an a great Australian in our eyes. Martin was my boss and my mentor during the time, in my time at the Brookings Institution, a think tank almost as revered as the Lowy Institute. Um, and I thank the Lowy Institute, Stephen Lowy and the Lowy family, um, Bruce Solomon, many of his friends who have worked to make this memorial service possible tonight. The Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister have asked me to read a statement on their behalf uh, acknowledging Martin's remarkable life of service and contribution to global affairs. But before I do that, on a personal uh, note, I want to say something also about Martin's values. You, you have heard and you no doubt will hear more tonight about Martin's incredibly impressive accomplishments as a diplomat, a scholar, uh, a practitioner of international affairs, which had such a substantive impact on uh, the work of making our world a better place to live in. But at its core, at his core, I think Martin's values were essentially that deep and abiding commitment to peace, to security, to stability, to ending conflict, to ending violence that inflicted so much pain and suffering on so many millions over so, so, so many years. And his life's work very much expressed these values in action. I remember fondly uh, our time at Brookings, and that was that he was always somewhat um, homesick or even nostalgic for Australia. Uh, I often was loitering in the corridor at the front of his office, talking very loudly with colleagues, and I'd hear this voice also yelling very loudly from inside his office, Peter, come in here. And I thought, am I in trouble? Um, did I do something wrong? Or does Martin have a, a special project for me, which was a bit more exciting? Uh, I'd go into his office and, and I'd say, yes, Martin, do you need to speak to me? And he'd say, no, no, I, uh, I, I really just wanted to hear your Australian accent a little bit longer. <laughs> and that would kick off a rather long conversation about foreign policy, the state of the world, politics, both US and Australian. He was particularly interested in Australian politics. 
and our ability to make a difference in our work. And he would give very, very good advice. I recall one sage bit of advice where he exhorted me. He pleaded with me to stay away from the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because it would suck me into, a, in his words, into a foreign policy vortex with, with not much space for any other policy areas. Well, Martin and I have tried to stick to that advice and keep my, my focus as wide as possible. Martin's legacy is also the good counsel he has given to me and to so many other diplomats, politicians and practitioners of international affairs some of whom are here tonight and some who are not, many who are spread around the world, uh, and I have no doubt are continuing his legacy uh, of peace building through their good works. Now, I've spoken to the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister just a few days ago uh, about Martin, um, and both expressed their heartfelt condolences to the Indic family. And they also reflected in, that, in those conversations on Martin's remarkable contribution to diplomacy. And of course, the Prime Minister wanted to claim him as an Australian, he was very keen on that. And I could assure you that both in the PM's uh, and the Foreign Minister's eyes, he's considered to be very much a great Australian. Um, I also heard from Ambassador Kevin Rudd uh, just as well, who wanted to relay to you a message from him uh, in his words, so I'll, I'll, I'll read out his message. He said that Martin was a friend and colleague of mine. I got to know him even better over the last decade I've lived and worked in the US. Very few Australians understand the extent to which he was revered in this country, for his scholarship, his policy leadership, and his humanity. He has been one of our finest representatives on the global stage, and that was from Ambassador Kevin Rudd. In conclusion, uh, I want to just read you the joint message from the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister of Australia. We mourn the passing of Martin Indyk, diplomat, negotiator, scholar. Though much of his professional life took place overseas, Australia is proud to lay claim to Martin's early years, and including his early years in Sydney, and his PhD at ANU. And of course, to his accent, which he reminded us always stayed distinctively Aussie, despite his globetrotting over 40 plus years that followed. Late last year, we were glad to be able to convey to Martin and to Gail how much his legacy meant to Australia, with his appointment as an honorary member of the Order of Australia. In a small but moving ceremony at his home in rural Connecticut with Australia's ambassador to the United States, Kevin Rudd. The honour was conferred for significant service to Australia-United States relations, particularly in the area of foreign policy and leadership. But Martin's legacy lives beyond our bilateral relationship, as important as that relationship is. As Sir Frank Lowy, AC, has said, uh, few Australians have had such a large impact on the world and for good. The direction of Martin's career and indeed his life changed when he left Australia for postgraduate study at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in the early 1970s. There in Israel at the height of the Yom Kippur War, he volunteered at a kibbutz in the country's south. Following this, he began a career as a diplomat, working to pr promote peace and security in the Middle East uh, through a series of vital roles in the United States. These included roles as Special Assistant to President Bl Bill Clinton and Senior Director of the Near East and South Asian Affairs at the United States National Security Council. He also served twice as US Ambassador to Israel under Presidents Clinton and Bush, and later Special Middle East Envoy for President Obama. Martin's life work, his commitment to the cause of Israeli-Palestinian peace, remains tragically unfinished. Speaking about the ongoing conflict in the region, Martin wrote in March 2024, if the conflict is to be resolved peacefully, the two-state solution is the only idea left standing. We remain committed to this goal, however distant it sometimes may seem. We know that Martin was an active mentor and cherished friend to many in Australia's international relations community. We pass on our condolences to Gail, to all of Martin's family, to Ivor and Shelley, uh, and all of his friends, Bruce, and all of his friends here tonight, to all those who mourn his loss. May his memory truly be a blessing. Long life to you all. Good evening. It's my great privilege as a representative of the United States government to share a few thoughts in honor of my very esteemed uh, fellow diplomat, Ambassador Martin Indyk. I offer my sincere condolences to the family and friends, some of whom are with us here tonight. May his memory be a blessing. I worked in the State Department during most of the 20 years that Ambassador Indyk was active in a variety of senior government roles, and he is someone that I admired greatly. When I worked on Near Eastern Affairs nearly 20 years ago, 
particularly focusing on the Sinai, his legacy as ambassador to Israel was still felt at that time in our efforts to maintain a modest National Guard presence in the Sinai. And wherever those archives reside of the Sinai's multinational force and observers, referred to as the MFO, I am certain that it reveals his efforts, both as Assistant Secretary of Near Eastern Affairs and also as Ambassador to Israel twice, the significant contributions of the MFO as one of the most successful and probably the least recognized pillars of peace in the Middle East in the past half century. I wanted to highlight from my own personal point of view two things I thought about when I read about his passing as a lifelong diplomat. First, as his biography reflects, he was not a typical, uh, he was not a career foreign service officer, he was not a conventional professional diplomat, but he excelled in diplomacy and strategy in a way that eclipsed most of us career officers. Ambassador Indic embodies a tradition that deeply enriches both American and Australian diplomacy, and that is the mix of uh, career professionals and political appointees. Outside experts like Ambassador Indic bring the richness of their non-governmental experiences and alternative points of view to bear on the toughest of issues and problems to the benefit of our national security and in his case, world peace. Martin Indic's life of service is a shining example to all career diplomats of what can be achieved when appointees and career officers work side by side together. Second, have we been reminded since the horrific events of October 7th refocused global attention on the Middle East peace process, US policy towards Israel and the Palestinians and advocacy for the two-state solution has been remarkably consistent since the 1980s. And uh, I, we owe this largely to Ambassador uh, Indic's committed work through many, many challenging periods over more than 30 years. Yesterday, an Israel Ambassador, uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken on his ninth trip in nearly as many months reflected a laser focus on securing an agreement that would put everyone on a better path to enduring peace and security. It is my deep hope that we will see peace and reconciliation in the Middle East, and my government continues to work tirelessly towards that goal when that goal is reached, I will remember Ambassador Indic in the first rank of those who built that future and be thankful for his life and for his example. While I did not work directly with Ambassador Indic, I reached out to others who did. My old boss, the Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern Affairs, David Welch, remembered Ambassador Indic fondly. He said, Martin was a great guy. In one way or another, he and I worked together ever since his first job in an administration which was at the National Security Council. He said he always stuck with the Arab-Israeli issue, despite its frustrations, its heartaches, and its Sisyphean character. Ambassador Welch described him as creative, relentless, and intellectually honest. He said he will be missed. Thank you for the opportunity to share a few thoughts on truly a legendary diplomat. Thank you. Good evening. It's a, it's a sort of sad evening, but it's a fabulous memorial to have to my brother. Firstly, I'd like to thank um, the Lowy Institute and Michael Fully Love for making this memorial possible. And Bruce Solomon, a very dear friend of our family, for doing all the coordination with myself, Ivor, and the Institute to create this memorable night. I'm Shelley Indick, for those who perhaps don't know who I am. <laughs> and I'm the youngest sibling and the only girl amongst my brothers. So, of course, I was either the spoiled, the loved, the teased, and the patronised by my brothers. Most photos of our early childhood show me between the two brothers, holding hands, looking upwards. And I was the lucky one 
to have two extraordinary brothers to look up to and learn from. And I am and was always so proud of them both. Tonight, how do I honour the memory of my brother? One of the longest relationships in our lives, actually, is the, the relationship with your sibling, if you're lucky enough. What can I say that hasn't already been touched on or said? Mainly, I can briefly share some of those personal moments between a sister and a brother about a long-distance friendship and a loving bond. The decades have blurred most of my childhood memories of growing up with my brothers, but I do recall being teased at dinner in a restaurant when I couldn't decide what to eat. Sharing afternoons with Ivor, reading poetry together, singing along with Martin badly as he strummed songs on his guitar, and sometimes being allowed to sit with my brothers and their mates and be part of their scene. It's memories of a younger sister. I don't recall huge fights or deep anger with either of them. I remember love, respect, certainly frustrations, and fun, and the need to stick together when our parents were being just too much. Martin, after graduating, lived in Canberra and returned to Sydney to set up a life with Jill, his first wife. I designed additions to their modernist house in Castle Crag with a dear colleague. I was a young architectural graduate and it was both nerve-wracking and exciting. And I think Martin loved the tallowwood clad timber box that we added in the garden for his study and the fact that his little sister was doing the job. When Martin and family moved to the US, our relationship from then on was like dipping into each other's worlds briefly and sometimes quite deeply. We both made an effort somehow, we all did, to keep contact. He would return to Sydney with family, sometimes for summer holidays, L later more for family main events like bar mitzvahs, weddings, birthdays and deaths. He was always there for those events. After our son Ilan was born, Miha and I went to live in Israel during 95 to 1998. Miha, an Israeli, wanted our son to meet his family there. And in addition, Martin and Jill were working hard in Martin's role as American ambassador to Israel, living with Sarah and Jacob in Tel Aviv. This allowed us to share family time. We lived in Yumin Moshe in Jerusalem. And, we, and when Ilan had his birthdays, Martin and family would arrive, accompanied by at least four plain clothes security agents in their armoured plate car. The security would check our house first and then allow Martin and family to share the party. He'd have time to mingle, sing happy birthday and help Ilan blow out the candles. And then we also shared his main events this time involving political events as well as personal. It was a special time for Ilan, our son, to get to know his uncle and family. When Ilan was about 11, we took him to New York for the first time. We were staying in the Chelsea Hotel. Martin came up from Washington to visit. There was a famous guitar shop next door to the hotel and Martin took Ilan next door to buy him an electric guitar. Very exciting. Martin valued those moments of family connection, no matter how busy his life was, always finding ways to be generous with his time, love and spirit, even in the midst of his demanding career. When Martin first heard he had esophageal, esophageal cancer, we were all so shocked. It was 2.17. I went to New York to be with him as he and Gail had moved there to have his treatments. Ivor and Evelyn also went some time later. I recall going to the hospital with him early in the morning for his chemo and then crossing Central Park to return to his apartment with him, he at a pace I could hardly keep up with, stopping at the Park Cafe for his oats, the only thing he could stomach, and then I would collapse in my hotel room for an hour, exhausted. He would then be preparing for a lunch meeting with Henry Kissinger, he was working on the second book, his second book, 
And he would tell me that it was sometimes a race or a gamble to see who would fall asleep first at lunch, Kissinger or Martin. <laughs> Kissinger was about 90. Martin was enduring chemo and radiation treatments. What can I tell you that you don't already know about Martin? He was so articulate, able to share his knowledge easily, a good teacher, as others have said, inclusive. When he had time, he gave of himself openly. He treated those people who worked with him and for him with a genuine interest and generosity. And Martin was a risk taker. He spoke out even when it was not diplomatic, not possibly safe to air such views, as others have mentioned. <laughs> I will always remember and love Martin's smile, disarming and joyful with the gap between his front teeth. <laughs> he called his first book An Innocent Abroad, and as Iva recently mused, what was a boy from Castle Crag, from immigrant parents whose paternal grandfather never spoke English, what was he doing in the American White House influencing policy on the Middle East? Well, we all know. Martin was committed to striving for peace in the Middle East. It was his obsession, his mission, his world. Sometimes to the detriment of family life and his health, but that was the sacrifice he and his family had to endure. endure. Martin and Gail came to Sydney for Ilan and Dunya's wedding, September 2023. He made a big effort. He seemed well, but he was having issues with his throat and voice box again, and he un had unexplained intense shoulder and hip pain. But we danced, we laughed, we shared stories. He spoke here, as Michael Philly Love said, at the Lowy Institute, about what he had learned from studying Kissinger's approach to peacemaking. He shared his insights and his criticisms of his own approach to peacemaking. He also talked of an almost inevitable negotiation that was evolving with Saudi Arabia and USA and its possible positive ripple effects. And then October 7 changed all things on the world stage. And separately, all things changed on Martin's intimate life stage. On his return to New York, Martin discovered that his cancer had metastasized throughout his body. At the same time, he suddenly had a stomach complication, which had reoccurred several times, which needed an, an immediate operation. Martin had called us, Ivor and I, and said he thought that he might not make it through the, through the operation. At that thought, um, Ilan and I quickly travelled to New York in October 23 to be with him and Gail. When the operation proved successful, although much weakened, he started the next battle to retain and rebuild his health against the cancer. He was always determined and hopeful he could get more time. Within the next six months, he wrote a definitive piece on the resurrection of the two-state solution in the March issue of Foreign Affairs titled, Does Peace Have a Chance? Received the Order of Australia and flew to the Bahamas to be with his team of close friends for Passover. I heard that he actually, there was a fancy dress and he was dressed as God. <laughs> Miha and I returned to New York in early July this year to Martin and Gail and family at the Lake House in Connecticut. Martin was not well. He was declining rapidly. He was courageous generous with his love, being a grandpa to the kids, grandkids that would, would arrive um, for the weekends, and brave, very brave in the face of death. The lake house gave him the opportunity to, to, to enjoy nature, listen to the birds, notice and remark on the beauty of the light. He was with family and friends. Gail, his wife, assisted and cared for him with dedicated love. Oddly, Martin and I had had several near-death experiences together. One when I was just 16 years old, in a small aircraft in New Zealand. There was at least a half an hour, which seemed like an eternity, when we both thought that it was the end. 
until we safely crashed, landed on Mount Cook with the sound of ambulances and fire engines coming to the rescue. Again in 1973, we were both at our friend Ron Zweig's apartment in Jerusalem when the sirens went off for what we would learn later was to be the Yom Kippur War. Again, we faced each other in one of those weird, is this it? moments as we ran to the apartment's miklat, the bomb shelter, never having heard air raid sirens before in our lives. But when the doctor told him in mid-July that there was no point continuing his immunotherapy, we were all devastated and this time it was final. Martin accepted the inevitable with grace and a peace. And though he is no longer physically with us, and though he has left a large void, his spirit, his wisdom, and his love remain with us all. May his memory be a blessing. Vala. Ladies and gentlemen, firstly, I thank the Indic family and the Lowy um, Institute for giving me this opportunity to express my immense respect and admiration for Martin. Immigrants never forget the kindness and hospitality that families give to them when they first come to this land. When my family arrived 60 years ago, one of the families that was truly good to us was the Indic family. The friendship and generosity that they showed has never been forgotten by me nor by my family, and I assure you, Shelley and Iva never will be. Martin's father, John Indic, was a wonderful man, a man of warmth, integrity, and enormous talent. There are many still today who function well because of the dexterity of his surgeon's hands. From my observations, Martin inherited many of his father's great qualities. And I was quite taken by the fact that Martin acknowledged this in the dedication of his book, Innocent Abroad. His dedication reads to my father, John Indick, the healer who taught me the value of integrity and innocence. Because of the link between my father and Martin's, both of whom laboured hard at Prince Henry Hospital for so many years, the Index invited us to visit a beautiful and picturesque holiday spot somewhere in New Zealand. It was there, as I was about to enter high school, that I met Martin, who I recall demonstrated at that point that he was an excellent student of the art of fishing. Martin was three years my senior at Sydney Grammar School. Unlike many older boys, he was remarkable because he was happy to talk to me, and I have to admit not many did. He was interested in what I had to say and even less thought that of me, and indeed offered me, while we fished together in New Zealand, some advice I took right through my schooling. The advice offered was to the effect that at Sydney Grammar School, the sportsman dominated and controlled the playground. And in Martin's view, I should politely ignore every single one of them. I followed this advice throughout my schooling and managed to pass all exams. Martin's mother, Mary, was a gregarious, entertaining and very interesting person. Over the years, I enjoyed many discussions with her. She too liked to talk to younger people. She, like all the Index, were generous of spirit. One morning she arrived at my parents' home with a bundle of school uniforms for me to wear. I still recall my mother being quite daunted by having to put my name into each of the coats. She remarked that the name Martin Indick was a great name and it was so beautifully sewn into each one of these school uniforms, perhaps she would be doing a disservice to me and I might say to Martin, to actually put my name in his place. As a consequence, for the first two years of high school, each time we gathered to retrieve our coats after sport, 
the relevant teacher would read out the various names of the owners of the coats. And when he read out Martin Indyk, I stuck up my hand and grabbed the coat. Remarkably to my memory, no one ever raised the question that I wasn't Martin Indyk. Now, I'm not sure, and Shetty might be able to tell you, how many people Martin shared his clothes with. But to this day, I continue to be very proud to be one of them. At Sydney Grammar School, Martin did extraordinarily well, as he did in life. He was great in English and generally. He started an organisation called Insight. Some of you may have thought his first think tank was somewhere in America, but it was actually here it's in Sydney. Thanks to the school's extensive archives, I found his report of 1968. He said of the Insight group that they had discussed during the year censorship, should it be banned, capital punishment, should it be retained, and the white Australia policy for and against. As you can see, nothing changes. In his report, he expressed views on both of these, which you're welcome to read if you so wish. But at the end, he showed that he was the ambassador because what he said was, if you disagree with the arguments above, then we urge you to come along to the next meeting and express your views. After Martin left school, our paths went separate ways, but I wasn't surprised at his amazing career. I was not at least surprised because I could see from what I'd seen at a comparatively young age that he had interest in world events, he had intellect, he had charm, he had stamina, and indeed, it was apparent to me, he would succeed enormously. As luck would have it, and Michael mentioned this and as did Stephen, 20 years ago, a great man, Frank Lowy, started this institute. Well, I don't know, Frank obviously didn't trust Michael, but he also asked me to talk to Martin. And Martin gave wonderful advice on how some of the governance should be done when he compared it to what was being done at Brookings. From that day, we started the annual coffee or lunch. Whenever I went to America, I always rang up and hoped he'd be nearby. When he came to Australia, it may have been a bar mitzvah for a wedding, but I thought he came to have coffee with me. <laughs> when I became a director more recently of the Lowy Institute, as Stephen so well put it, we had the 20 minutes with Martin. No one could take the complex and make it as simple as he did. No one could give you that feeling when he talked about somebody that he actually knew them, and he did. I will be one who will miss, as I know Stephen and the others around the board table will, that 20 minutes. Indeed, we may just sit there, Stephen, and look at the screen. Martin was a great man, a, gr a man who came into my life when I was young. He exceeded all expectations looking at his fishing, and I today would wear his school uniform with pride and indeed stick my hand up first that I am Martin Indyk. Friends, <clears throat> I deliver this tribute on behalf of my brother, Murray Good, Emeritus Professor of Politics at Macquarie University, who is overseas. He says, I'm honoured to have been asked to say a few words about Martin, a fine scholar, a brilliant commentator on the international relations of the Middle East, and a diplomat of world renown. More than that, a much-loved cousin and at Macquarie University for a time, a highly esteemed colleague. If I were in Sydney and able to access books, journals and other records, as David has, I would have been able to write with greater certainty and been able to say more. I can only speak from memory. The obituaries for Martin in the London Times, the Washington Post and even in the Australian focused as they are on Martin's extraordinary career from 1985 in the United States slide over his earlier career in Australia. Some mention in passing his graduation from the University of Sydney in 1972 with first-class honours in government and public administration, his PhD from the ANU with a thesis on US foreign policy towards the Middle East on a scholarship that enabled him to spend a year in the United States, 
and his appointment in 1978 as a lecturer in politics at Macquarie University, where I happen to be working. What has been missed in all the tributes is any reference to Martin's brief stint in the ONA, the Office of National Assessment, set up by the Fraser government in 1977, to provide assessments on international political, strategic and economic developments to the Prime Minister and the National Security Committee of Cabinet. The position at Macquarie was advertised as a lectureship in Australian politics. Martin appealed as someone well able to teach a course in Australian foreign policy, well credentialed, should the need arise, to teach a course on the international relations of the Middle East, and well equipped to supervise PhD students in international relations more generally. The merits of Martin's appointment were, however, contested, as most university appointments are. What was unusual, perhaps, was the fact that everyone in the department was involved in the selection process. There were people, yes, even in the politics department, who confused Martin's earlier role in the processing of foreign intelligence, the role of ONA, with the processing of domestic intelligence, the role of ASIO. One or two others worried about the prospect of Martin being asked to teach anything to do with the Middle East, which was an area the department already covered, uh, but not in a way that showed much sympathy to Israel. Political scientists are notoriously bad at predicting anything, but let me suggest that had he taught Middle East politics at Macquarie, which he didn't, Martin might have changed that. There was another reason for preferring Martin. We were in the business of attracting students, especially in first year, and of holding them. Truth to tell, this was empire building. The more students we could attract, the more staff we could appoint. And when the department turned its mind to which of the candidates' interests might generate students' interest, Martin's interest prevailed easily. I took no part in the decision. Martin's ONA background did matter, as it turned out, but not in the way that some members of the department had imagined. For Martin, handling foreign intelligence one day and teaching undergraduate students the next proved a step too far. As he later remarked to me, being exposed to high-level intelligence about the region at ONA was rather different to being exposed at Macquarie or anywhere else, to undergraduate students who had difficulty finding Indonesia on a map. <laughs> but before leaving Macquarie, Martin the scholar had already made his mark. Even as an undergraduate, he'd produced work that would make an impact, not work in the first instance on international relations, but pioneering work on the importance of stockbroking in the political economy of Australia in the 1960s, a piece published in the ANZ Journal of Sociology. Work on international relations followed. This included, in particular, a magisterial overview of the study of international relations in Australia for a handbook on Australian political science commissioned by the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia and edited by Don Aitken, who, as head of our department in 1978, had been the person ultimately responsible for bringing Martin to Macquarie. There had been speculation during the 1970s that a coalition government might offer Don a diplomatic position. Whether he was made an offer but turned it down, I don't know. No one, however, including Martin, would have speculated that in the mid-1990s, Martin would be offered a senior diplomatic position by an American administration. Happily, that kind of offer was one, one Martin was never likely to turn down. May his memory be a blessing. Lost my bifocals. Um, I'm really honoured to be here. As fond as I was of Martin and Dick, many of you knew him a lot better than I did, but he did give every indication of being somewhat fond of me, but my relationship with him was purely professional. Over a dozen or more years of tumultuous Middle Eastern history, 
we did share many hours together, mostly on live television. And I can say without doubt that Martin Indyk was the Australian I most admired in the world. Like the subject of his last book, the indefatigable Henry Kissinger, Martin was a master of the game. So I went back over the past few weeks to try and find the transcripts of uh, many of those late line interviews. I found only fragmentary evidence of them because though they used to be kept online by the ABC, the ABC got rid of that um, resource, unfortunately, and I hate them for it. Um, I only found fragmentary evidence of those transcripts kept online by the Brookings Institution or mentioned in dispatches by other reporters and columnists. So as annoyed as I am at the ABC, I stand here as the last living late line witness of those interviews. Um, and I can give you only, therefore, an impressionistic account of how Martin helped us to understand the complexities of those terrible Middle Eastern conflicts and understand how deeply they affect our lives here in Australia, though we live very far away and on the other side of the planet. Now, the most obvious examples were the September 11 terrorist attacks and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq that inevitably drew us all in. As always, Martin was looking for a way out, how best to navigate the post-9-11 world to define peace. On Late Line, early in 2002, he contended that reducing the terrorist threat would require an overall change in Washington's approach to Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and other Arab states whose dictatorial regimes were compromising US national security. Martin always understood, I believe, the inherent danger of hypocrisy in foreign policy, and not only in relation to so-called Arab allies. I believe that notion underlined his distaste for Bibi Netanyahu and the path Netanyahu has laid towards a never-ending conflict. I'm not suggesting here that security of Israel was not an overriding priority for Martin. It most certainly was. You all know that. I was reminded of the cyclical nature of the never-ending conflict when I came across a rare transcript of one of our interviews that we did in July 12, 2006. It begins like this, my introduction. Well, to talk about tonight's developments to Israel's north and the ongoing crisis in Gaza, both involving kidnapped Israeli soldiers, I'm joined now by Martin Indyk. And I asked him uh, briefly, uh, how bad could this get? Martin said, well, I think in the short term, very bad. Unfortunately, I don't think it's been reported yet, but I'm hearing that seven Israeli soldiers were also killed in this Hezbollah attack on Israel's northern border overnight. And that means that, as you've said, tanks are moving across the border, and I would expect to see a major escalation in fighting on Israel's northern border. Of course, Israeli tanks moved yesterday in force to divide Gaza in two, and reports out of Israel this morning are that they are calling up reserves as well, kidnappings of Israeli troops and two-front conflict in Gaza and Lebanon. Does that sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> it's just incredible, really, the cyclical nature of things. But what an incredible resource for us and for our viewers to be able to tap into the sophisticated analysis of one of the world's best informed actors and commentators. Um, think about the line, I don't think it's been reported yet. In other words, here's something that you're hearing late at night in Australia before anyone else in the world. It really is hard to imagine that we'll ever be able to tap into such an extraordinary individual again on a regular basis. To sum up my thoughts, I want to come back to the idea of Martin as a master of the game, the great game of diplomacy. In my view, even more so than the controversial Nobel Peace Prize winner Henry Kissinger, the holder of that accolade, master of the game in the title of Martin's last book, Martin Indyk was truly an ambassador for peace. Who knows what he might have achieved if Donald Trump had not sprung from the netherworld to thwart Hillary Clinton's bid for the White House. I imagine this as a sliding door moment in history. There's good reason to believe that Martin would have become, in a Hillary-led administration, the first Australian US Secretary of State. He certainly would have been in the highest levels advising, not for the first time, a Clinton White House. And he would have gone on charming many with that funny accent, and even that famous endearing gap between his front teeth, I believe, was charming. His wry, wise smile, his inherent calm, a camouflage for his steel trap mind and his shining intellect. And as all of us know, in that last and forever unwritten chapter of his life, 
If he had made it back into the top tier of officials in the White House, Martin Indyk would surely have devoted all of his considerable energies and all of his powers of persuasion in an effort for peace. The saddest of sliding doors has taken us, unfortunately, in the other direction. I'm sure that Martin Indyk's unquenchable energy would have surely focused on the one logical conclusion, the only idea left standing, as Martin himself argued in the last few months of his life, which is a few months ago in March, actually, as the present horrors in Gaza raged on and he neared the end of his own life, the only idea left standing, the two-state solution. That's where my thoughts took me uh, when I heard that he had died. I knew that the world had been robbed of someone precious and that the alternative history may never happen. Um, and a stirring of national pride happened as well. I felt a kinship to this precious human. He'd grown up near where I lived, a Sydney boy from the suburbs, and a uniquely Australian character, one whose destiny was to fulfil a great mission far beyond this pretty and peaceful place. And though he moved away from Australia and left us to our sanguine peace, Martin Indyk, Martin Indyk remains, in my mind, very much a part of us, and he will always be among the very best of us. Barbara and I were going to see Martin and Gail this November, but brought the trip forward. Six weeks ago, we visited them at their lake house in Connecticut. He requested we bring up bagels, pastrami, pickles, and kasha from the Second Avenue Deli, and Barbara made him a kosher chicken soup with matzo ball dumplings. Martin was in good spirits, unfortunately in a wheelchair. He was delighted with the food. It reminded him of his childhood at Castle Crag. He ate very little. We stayed with them, with Gail and Martin, for two nights. I went fishing three times with him on his pontoon on the lake. There were no more fish in the lake for Martin. Certainly there was more talking than fishing. But on the third time we went fishing, I cast the lure into some structure just below the pontoon, and I handed the rod to Martin. He was sitting in his wheelchair, and suddenly there was a fish on the line. And I said to him, Martin, give me the rod, I'll put it in. And he looked up to me and said, piss off, I'll, I'll catch it. Well, he didn't. And I abused him for it, as friends do, about how he should let me pull the fish in and it was one fish and whatever, whatever. I had a lovely time with him on that lake. And, uh, you know, while I was there, Gal had his phone. He was no longer taking calls. And who rang? The Clintons, Blinken, Jake Sullivan, White House, White House staff, many of whom had worked for him, Israeli and US negotiators for the hostages, the Qatari Prime Minister negotiator, Thomas Friedman, and many, many others. Some were still asking for his advice, others wanting to see how their friend was going. He did not take the cause, he wanted to, but he could not. He was still needed. Today, he is still needed. You know, growing up in Sydney, our crowd has been so incredibly successful. There are judges, professors, scientists, geniuses, amazing creatives, billionaires. There's been no one as accomplished as Martin in our crowd, no one. I mean, how many Australians have had the impact that he's had on world events? Murdoch, Monash, yeah, Bert Ebert at the United Nations. Goff and China in the very early part, Keating on Asian, Frank certainly here, but Martin was right up there making history at the centre of power. 
He loved being an Aussie overseas. He was always excited when he came back here to visit. As everyone had said, he kept his accent. He was such a larrikin like that. There was a mischievous side to him. I remember Barbara and I went to visit him in Washington in the late 90s. And uh, he said to me, I have arranged with the security at the White House to get you into the Oval Office and I'm going to get you into the President's chair and we're going to take a photograph. I said, fantastic. So we had dinner and then a phone call happened and he went into the study and he's on the phone and I said, you know, I went in there and said, what's going on? Why can't we leave? And he put his hand over the phone. I've got Assad from Syria on the phone. I've got to take this call. I said, Martin, where's your priorities? I didn't go to the Oval Office. Um, he had no airs and graces. He was very, very down to earth. Um, he had a great sense of humour. His greeting around the world, wherever he went, was "G'day, mate." And he was always um, he was always impeccably dressed. He he loved zipping around in his sports car. Uh, he had great style to him, Martin. Um, that seemed to reflect the artistic and stylish home that the Index had in Castle Crag, and I was a great mate of Shelley's at that time. He, he was not a jealous man. He just wanted a better world, and he was very generous in his view. Like, for instance, he would give credit to Jared Kushner for achieving the Abraham Accords. He helped many, many Aussies and many, many people. He was always there, as we as we heard from Frank, he loved Frank. He loved going on Frank's boat. He, he thought the world of Frank. He encouraged um, Liam Gertrude to establish the New Israel Fund. Uh, he was on the board of the New Israel Fund. He did a lot of work for the Israel Policy Forum. He assisted Ron Finkel in establishing Project Rosanna in Israel. He did so many things. He worked on the world stage. His work on the world stage was all consuming. He loved it. He never loved dealing with Bibi. I recall in 1999 going to the embassy in, in Israel. He was there and he was complaining about Bibi. Some things don't change. Martin was driven by wanting Israel to have a long-term, democratic, secure future and for the Palestinians to have their own state and dignity. No matter how many twists and turns he believed that a two-state solution had to come about in the end. He was still speaking about that when we were fishing on the lake. He believed the United States could make that happen. For me, it was a rare pleasure to have someone who agreed with my politics on Israel. Um, over the last 40 years, we became very, very close friends. I was very proud that he was my mate. Nearly 20 years ago, he met Gail, his soulmate. Um, Gail and Martin described that they had a mixed marriage, not from religion, but that she was um, Republican royalty. Um, Gail uh, was Nancy Reagan's private secretary of the first term in the White House. Gail was Henry Kissinger's secretary for five years. And Martin was a, a red blood Democrat. And uh, well, what a fabulous marriage. Um, and, you know, Tony spoke about the possibility of Martin becoming Secretary of State. Yeah, he, he thought it was a strong possibility, and he was pretty surprised when Trump got up. I spoke to Gail this morning. She said he never gave up. He was a fighter for the United States, for Israel, and, and with his health. She said he lived a very busy life, and up until his last few months, he never stopped working, writing, expressing opinions, talking to people in the administration, and talking to Israeli and Arab leaders. She said she's been astounded how many letters she has found in Martin's papers from successful people, well-known people he has mentored over the decades. She said he was not bitter, that his life was cut short. He just wanted more time with his grandchildren. Faith and tradition became important to him over time. He, he changed. And, and uh, he started to become a lot more spiritual. 
He loved his daily walk in Central Park from his apartment on 74th and Park. And when I had a stroke, he told me he prayed every day for my recovery at what he called the Angel Fountain in Central Park. Well, it worked. Uh, he and Gail recently arranged to have a memorial plaque for him placed in perpetuity on a bench seat near the Angel Fountain. And Barbara and I will be sitting there in November. At Martin's burial in Washington on July 30th, his coffin was draped with the US flag. Two Marines folded the flag and presented it to Gail. The flag at Capitol Hill was half-mast. At the Jewish funeral house, Michael quoted the words from the, the ethics of our fathers. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. Martin, what a full life you had. I miss you. May your memory be a blessing. Well, thank you, Bruce, and thank you to all the distinguished speakers this evening. Uh, I think we, had, we heard so many different dimensions of Martin. Martin the diplomat, Martin the scholar, Martin the late-line interviewee, Mar but also Martin the sibling, Martin the guitarist, Martin the fisherman, Martin the fan of deli food, Martin the White House burglar. Um, I, I did have a sense very much that Martin was with us this evening and I think if we check David Gonski's suit jacket, we might find Martin's <laughs> name inscribed there. In fact, when David put his hand up at the end and said, I'm Martin Indyk, it was a bit like that I'm Spartacus uh, moment. I, th I thought every might, everyone might join him. Um, Tony Jones mentioned the sliding doors interpretation of Martin's life, which is one take on it. The other take is that he led an incredible life on its own terms, a life well lived, a full life, um, a life that took him from this country all around the world, that finished with him fishing in Connecticut with an old friend, appreciated, fated, receiving phone calls from the world leaders. And perhaps that's the interpretation I would, pref I would like to finish with. Um, like most Aussies, it also came out tonight that Martin was a character a larrikin, he had a gap in his teeth, he also had a twinkle in his eye and a sense of humour and my experience was he liked to party. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope that now you will join me, the board members of the Lowy Institute and the Indic family for some refreshments. We invite you for something to eat, some kosher wine or if you prefer a glass of scotch so we can toast our friend Martin Indic. Thank you ladies and gentlemen and good evening. Thank you.